This evening we are starting a new lecture series, Museums Talk from the USA, and we will have significant guests from leading American museums. And each month we will host one or two lectures from an important speaker. Each lecture will be about a key topic, such as museum management, curatorial practice, collections and archives, audience development and public relations, education and social programs, events, local and global marketing and communication strategies, new technologies, redefinition of space and museum architecture. The history of museology and art institutions in the USA have laid impressions on today's museum practice and left an impact on the proceedings of cultural institutions all around the world. In this respect, museum directors, curators, and department directors from established art museums in the USA will be invited to share their knowledge and experience. I truly believe this series will be an important reference and guide for museum studies in Turkey. Istanbul Morun is making this series in partnership with US Mission in Turkey. I would like to thank them for this wonderful cooperation. The first speaker of museum's talk from the USA will be Nil Berenzra. He is the director of SF MoMA. I would like to thank him for joining us. Welcome to Istanbul Modern Neil. Neil Benezra will present an illustrated talk on the history and future plans of the museum. Founded in 1935, SF MoMA is one of the oldest and finest museum of modern and contemporary art in the United States. Recently, SF MoMA announced that the Fisher Collection, one of the greatest collections of contemporary art in the world, will be joining the museum. Plans are well underway for an expansion to be designed by the architectural firm Sunetta, and the new building will be complete in 2016. Now I would like to give the floor to Neil. We are listening to you, Neil. Thank you. Does that sound okay? You can hear well enough? Okay. So it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here for a lot of reasons. Uh, Istanbul is such an extraordinary city. It's not a city that uh, Americans get to, frankly, often enough. And um, when I was invited to come give this talk, I thought, what a great opportunity. Um, not least because it's uh, a marvelous city, um, a, a growing center of art, uh, and just in the se seemingly in the center of everything these days. Um, personally, it had a special resonance for me because um, uh, my father and uh, his, not my father, my father's parents actually immigrated to the United States uh, from Istanbul. And so it's a great opportunity for me to begin to get at some of the roots that I have here. Um, so it's a pleasure, it really is a pleasure to be here. And I'll say a word about my father uh, in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do tonight is to give you, uh, show you a lot of slides, uh, I hope, which I hope you'll enjoy looking at, uh, and give you um, a little bit of background of my museum. Uh, I've been there since 2002. Uh, a lot has happened in the last 10 years, uh, but I want to frame the developments of the last, uh, developments of the last couple of years and where we're headed in the next, uh, in, the, in the immediate future against the history of the museum. Um, so I'll do that briefly, talk a little bit about collections and art that's coming that we've, we've acquired, tell some stories about certain pictures, uh, and then talk as well about um, our future. And I'll show you some, some um, renderings of the architecture as it, as it looks right now. So, and I'd be very happy to answer as many questions as, uh, as you might have for me at the end. So again, thank you. So the first picture here, uh, as you can probably judge from the uh, vintage of those cars, is uh, the museum uh, many, many years ago. The, as, um, as was mentioned, the, ex the museum was opened in 1935, uh, and it was located in this building. It's a, a city hall building. Um, and it was uh, located in, on the third and fourth floors of this it was a, a handsome building on the outside, but not such a great building on the inside. A tiny little elevator that took you up to the third and the fourth floor where the galleries were. Uh, a tiny little bookstore on the ground floor, a little cafe. Uh, a very modest little operation. But this is where we were in 1935. Um, now let's see. Okay, got to get the hang of things here. Um, it's, it's important to start out by saying that um, American museums, by and large, are very different from, uh, let's say, European museums 
in that we're not state funded. We, have, we receive very, very little money from the, state go from the federal government, the city government, and so forth. Um, we're more or less a private museum, and, um, and that means that we're governed by a board of trustees that has the oversight for our operation, our budget, our collections, all the work that we do. Um, and as normally, normally is the case in the United States, um, this has led to, um, and it's a bit of a generalization, but I think it's true, uh, that, that generally the museum trustees have tended to be women, and they've tended to hire muse museum directors who were men. Um, and you can speculate about the reasoning there. But in San Francisco, and San Francisco is a little different than most places, I, 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 would, uh, I, would, I would tell you. Uh, in San Francisco, it was just the opposite. We had uh, uh, men who were trustees of the museum, founded the museum in 1935, and their first director was, in fact, a woman. It's a woman you see here holding this painting. Her name was Grace McCann Morley, uh, extraordinary woman, uh, one of the first women museum directors in the United States, and presumably of you know, museums anywhere in the world. Uh, and an extraordinary lady. She was the director from 1935 to 1958. She brought a kind of missionary zeal to her work, incredible uh, energy, uh, and as I'll point out here in a couple of minutes as we go along, uh, did some remarkable work very, very early, before most museums, certainly in the United States. One of the first pictures to come into our collection was this painting uh, by Frida Kahlo. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that um, this painting, we opened in 1935, this painting was made in 1931, and it, it came to the museum in 1936, the year after we opened. Um, uh, Grace McCann Morley uh, befriended a man uh, who was in, in the insurance business in San Francisco and was a great collector and a patron, and he was responsible for the first thousand works of art that were given to the museum between 1935 and 1940, and he was also responsible for bringing Diego Rivera to San Francisco to paint uh, five murals. Um, in those days, and this is now, the, again, the 30s, it, you know, uh, it was, Frida, Frida Kahlo was not the, uh, the rock star, the, the, the cultural hero that she is today around the world. She was, in those days, she was Diego Rivera's wife, and she happened to be a painter as well. Um, and so Rivera came to San Francisco, and as I think most of you will know, uh, Frida Kahlo had a terrible accident on a tram in Mexico City when she was a, a teenager, and, and they kind of found a home in San Francisco. Diego painting the murals that he painted, and Frida Kahlo found a doctor who could actually treat her back, which was a terrible, uh, kind of tragic, uh, physical ailment that she suffered with. Um, this painting, uh, it turns out, we, as I said, we acquired it in 1936. It is, to this day, the most acquired work of art in our collection for loan. I must receive a letter asking from another museum asking for the loan of this picture probably every two or three weeks. Um, it's, it's an enormously popular painting in our collection and around, around the country, and there are so many Frida Kahlo shows being done at all times that, that it's in constant demand. And the other thing I would just say about, about this picture and about Kahlo is that uh, having this picture made it possible for us to organize a uh, retrospective of Kahlo's work in 2008. And that exhibition, which attracted 425,000 visitors to the museum to that show, is to this day, and throughout the history of the museum, uh, the 77-year history of the museum, the, most, it's the best attended exhibition in our history. Um, so it's, it, it, ha it has a kind of fond place in, in, our, uh, in the culture of our museum, if you will. Um, skip ahead a few years to 1939, and this is, the, if, if there was one really beautiful gallery in this old building of ours, it was this ro beautiful rotunda. Um, and what you're looking at, of course, is, is Guernica, uh, Picasso's Guernica, which was painted in 1937. And I, I, I'm guessing you know the story very well of this painting. It's certainly the most important, most famous painting of the 20th century. Uh, and it was painted in protest by Picasso, who was living in, as an expatriate in Paris uh, in 1937, during the Spanish Civil War, in protest uh, uh, for the, uh, the aerial bombardment of this vast town called Guernica. Um, and you know we have to sort of think back to this period in time, this is the 30s, you know, we didn't have the kind of instant news coverage of wartime events that we all know about now. In those days, you had to open the newspaper and read about something. And what Picasso read about was the, this was the first aerial bombardment in wartime of a, of a, of a, of a civilian population. And it, it more or less uh, destroyed the town of Guernica, and, and Picasso read about this and tried to visualize, tried to imagine what, what this must have 
what, what this must have looked like. And uh, those of you who uh, know this painting, either from its uh, time at the Museum of Modern Art or today it's in the Reina Sofia in Madrid, uh, know it's an enormous, very powerful painting and very, very large. So what happened was the, the painting, um, uh, it, was, it was decided by Picasso that as long as Franco was in power in Spain, as long as the, Frank, the, uh, the fascists were in, in power there, uh, he wouldn't allow the painting to go to Spain where he, he intended it to go. Uh, and so it was sent, uh, sort, of, sort of for safekeeping, I suppose you might say, uh, to the United States, and it would eventually take up residence at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and it was where I first saw it, frankly, at, uh, uh, when, I was, when I was young. Well, on its way to the Museum of Modern Art, it made a tour around the United States, and its first stop in our country was in, in our museum. And um, it's, it's quite an extraordinary story because it was, in those days, museum exhibitions were only up for three or four weeks. Uh, the exhibition reached its final day, Sunday afternoon, uh, and San Francisco being full of, even in those days, great political activists and everybody wants to protest everything all the time in San Francisco, and they do. Uh, and in this case, they staged a sit-down strike and would not allow the museum to close. Five o'clock rolled around the museum, they would not allow the museum to close. Uh, and the museum actually stayed up all night, stayed open all night. Um, it's an extraordinary story about, I think, the taste for contemporary art that goes back you know, decades in San Francisco. Um, and it's also a, a kind of a wonderful story of this painting uh, making its tour around the United States. This, this became the great painting, and I'll come back to this in a, in a few minutes, that uh, one confronted later when you went to the Museum of Modern Art, when you went up into those galleries in New York, this was the first painting you saw. And for artists like Jackson Pollock, and I'll talk more about him in just one second in the next slide, actually, uh, this, he, Picasso and Guernic was the painting that he had to beat. He had to somehow find a way past this, this great painting that, that Picasso had made. Well, uh, I mentioned that our, our, our founding director, Grace McCann Morley, was quite a, um, quite, quite a stalwart, quite a, quite a missionary for, for, the, for, the, for the cause of modern and contemporary art. And so she, quite remarkably, she was very prescient and she, um, she gave first museum shows to a number of, of young artists. Among them was Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock, uh, who had his first museum exhibition, a show of just about six or seven paintings, at our museum in 1944. And this painting, uh, Guardians of the Secret, was in that exhibition. Um, and uh, obviously it was painted in 1943, the year before the show. And in, um, in looking through our archives a couple of years ago when we were celebrating our 75th anniversary, we found a, an exchange of correspondence between Morley, our director, and Peggy Guggenheim, who was a Jackson Pollock's um, a dealer in New York. And, and in, this, in this exchange of letters, um, Morley writes several, on several occasions how grateful she is to the dealer for allowing her lots and lots of time to be patient because she had to convince her trustees that it was important to give a show to this young artist who no one had ever heard of um, and, 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 and how grateful she was. And then the last letter thanks um, uh, Peggy Guggenheim for her, her patience now in allowing her time to raise the money to buy the painting. And she says something to the effect that I'm just paraf paraphrasing here. I was so grateful to you because your discounting the painting from $750 to $500 made it possible for us to purchase the painting. So it's a wonderful story of, a, of, a, of great perseverance on the part of a museum director and I, you know, I can't even begin to imagine what this painting is worth now. Uh, it's not one of the great drip paintings from later, but it's, a, it's an enormously valuable painting and one of the cornerstones of our collection. Um, this painting has particular meaning for me. It's by Clifford Still, and it's another, another example of, uh, of, a, of a very well-known abstract expressionist painter in the United States having his first museum show uh, in our museum. Um, I mentioned my father earlier, and uh, in fact, he, he was an art teacher. He retired now. He was an art teacher in the San Francisco area. And so as a result, I went to this museum I saw every show for probably 10 or 15 years. Every couple of months, my parents would drag me not exactly kicking and screaming, but you know, I wasn't. I would rather have been, you know, playing sports or something. Um, but I remember at, at the age of about ten or eleven, seeing this painting. And if you know Still's work at all, you'll know that early on in his work, he gave his pictures referential titles, such as self-portrait, in this case. And that at a certain point, he decided he 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 wanted to abhor all titles, no references in the titles at all, and he would just give the, the paintings a title 
uh, this might be 1945 B number three or something like that. So you couldn't, there could be no allusion to anything based on the title. So I remember standing very distinctly as a, probably 11, 12 years old, standing in front of this painting, which is you know, exactly human scale, and, and wondering aloud to my father, I kind of pulled him over and I said, you know, I don't understand the self-portrait. Uh, there's no, there's no self-portrait here. There's no body there. There's no person. And my father, who was himself as an art teacher, but he was also an abstract painter, um, could explain to me that an artist could refer, in a sense, uh, allude. Let me put it this way: allude to a human being or a human presence or a human psychology or a psyche through abstract painting. And you know, there's a there's a hint of a little figure, and you can't really see it here because the lights are a little bright, but there's a little red figure there, just a bare outline of something. Um, and I remember this, this was my, you know, my fa I had a father who was an art teacher and a painter, and I had my own private you know, docent uh, in the family. And this was the painting that got me started, got me interested in art. Uh, and it's, uh, it's always had a kind of special meaning for me, and to be able to now work in the museum where this painting lives is, is, is really quite special. But again, it's another case of, of a museum giving an artist his first, uh, first museum show, um, and then building a collection, acquiring works later. And this is very much in our, in our museum's history. So I'm going to jump ahead now. That's sort of just a little, little sort of um, a look back, a little retrospective look at the, at the history of the museum, just to give you a, a feeling for it. Um, what happened was that in this 19, by the 1970s, uh, the, the community of San Francisco had developed quite a, a group of private collectors uh, and industrialists and people who were very active and very uh, prosperous. Um, and they had they'd come to realize that the building that I showed you, where, where the museum was located, really wouldn't be sufficient if we really had aspirations to be a world-class museum. Uh, I think it didn't hurt at all the fact that, you know, San Francisco and Los Angeles have a kind of interesting rivalry in, in the state of California, and, and, and the Museum of Contemporary Art had just opened in 1976 in Los Angeles, and I think there was a little, a little rivalry that, that took hold, uh, and our, uh, our trustees, you know, wouldn't take that sitting down, as it were. And so they decided they would, they would build a new museum, uh, and they built it in a part of the city which was really not inhabited by anybody who was interested in visual culture. Uh, there was, this was a neighborhood that was filled with uh, parking lots and warehouses. Artist studios happened to be there. It was, it was inexpensive real estate, and so the museum could move there. And so what they did was they engaged uh, an architect, a Swiss architect named Mario Botta, uh, to design the new building. And this is the building uh, that, that opened in 1995. Um, at that point, the museum had taken more or less the form it has today in terms of the program that we offer. Uh, we have a, a very good painting and sculpture program, a, quite a good photography program. Um, and, and we were one of the first museums in the United States to have a media arts department, that is to say, film and video, uh, and then also architecture and design. So those are our four main areas in which we're active in terms of exhibitions and collections. We also have a very active education program. So all of this was more or less in place by 1995. I'll come back to the, the form of this building in a couple of minutes. So uh, like most museums, um, our, our reputation um, initially was based upon, once we arrived in this new building in 1995, was based primarily on our, uh, or the, or the exhibitions that we organized. And we organized a lot of very, I have to say, very good, strong exhibitions. I think we've defined our exhibition program in terms of uh, the desire to be central players in the writing of the history of the art of our time. If I could characterize it, that's probably the way I would do it. And so we've organized major retrospective exhibitions of a number of very important artists. And I think our curators have picked well through the years. Uh, this is a Saul LeWitt retrospective that we organized, as you can see, in 2000, which traveled widely. It went to New York, uh, Chicago, and then it traveled in, in Europe. We also organized a wonderful Diane Arbus exhibition. This was the exhibition that uh, opened soon after I arrived at the museum. Uh, Diane Arbus, and there's some wonderful photographs in the exhibition downstairs, a photography show having to do with portraiture. Um, uh, this was a, a great, great exhibition that was, that took, was years in the making. Uh, it was, at that time, certainly the most expensive exhibition of photography ever organized. Uh, very, very complicated. Uh, and it traveled very, very well, again, to the East Coast and, to, and very well in Europe. It was in, I think, uh, Paris and London, uh, and I think another, another stop in, um, in Germany as well. 
um, just two years ago, it's almost two years ago now, we organized this exhibition called The Steins Collect. Um, this was a very interesting exhibition um, in which we put together the combined collections of the Stein family. And you'll know the Stein family principally because of Gertrude Stein, the great uh, poet, but she and two brothers um, were from San Francisco, as a matter of fact. And before Gertrude Stein was a poet and a writer, uh, she was an art collector. And she and her two brothers um, uh, moved from the Bay Area to Paris in their 20s uh, as a kind of a group of expatriates and lived in Paris for the, most of the rest of their lives. And they arrived there in uh, 1905 at just the time they could, you know, one could still collect young artists, Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse. Uh, they couldn't do it for very long. The, the prices became, they didn't have so much money, they didn't have that much money they could spend on paintings, but they were able to make some major acquisitions and they really became the first collectors of these two great, uh, great French artists. And so what we did was to um, gather, uh, over the course of about 10 years, we gathered together as many of the pictures that this family, this extended family, collected through the years, brought them back together, and put them on view. It was a great story because um, it was a great partnership that we had. The exhibition was shown at the Grand Palais in Paris and the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And it was a great story because we in San Francisco and our collectors and our community really pride ourselves in, in engaging with artists at a young age. And here was a case of um, these, these very adventuresome collectors doing just that. Um, and it, it, it's kind of inspirational for anybody who who really had the ambition to be a great collector and to really be, take the risk of, um, of collecting young, young artists. So this was a very important show for us and very, very popular and great show, I would say. Um, and then I just show you this slide of William Kentridge. This was an exhibition that, um, that uh, I was very fond of, very well involved with. Uh, and I bring it up because, and I, I'm sure you know, but William Kentridge is a wonderful South African artist who makes charcoal drawings and then animates them. In a, in a wonderful kind of um, very simple way, but very, very powerful work having to do with principally the history of apartheid and the post-apartheid period in South Africa. And um, this exhibition, I, I actually raise it here because it, it toured uh, to, I think, 11 different museums. It, went, it traveled around the United States. It went to the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it traveled to Paris, Vienna, Moscow, uh, Jerusalem, and St. Petersburg. It, um, you know, too bad it didn't come to Istanbul, I suppose I could say, uh, because it, it would have been, I think, beautiful in this building. But this gives you a sense of the program that, that we developed uh, in the last 15 or 20 years. Now, the, the next step in the, I think, the maturation of a museum, the next, next natural step, is to really develop a great collection. And I've shown you some of the paintings that we'd acquired through the early years in the history of our, our museum. And um, what, what happened in the most wonderful way was that after the museum opened, uh, and suddenly we had much more gallery space than we had ever had before. A remarkable woman, and, and it's, it's interesting the, the important role that's, that women have played in the history of our museum. A wonderful woman uh, who you will, not know, you will not know this name, it's a woman named Phyllis Wattis, and, and she was in her 90s at this time when the building was opened. And she essentially, she was a trustee of the museum, and she essentially challenged the board and the next generation of trustees of this museum, who were great collectors, she said, now that we have this building, we've got to build a collection that's worthy of it. And she really led this effort uh, and, and, and made amazing acquisitions for the museum uh, with the help of our, our curators and, our, and the director at that time. And i just give you a couple of examples of this. This is a wonderful Rene Magritte painting, a later painting from 1952, which has been very, very important. It's a cornerstone of our collection, just like the Frida Kahlo is. Uh, and it's, it's been a very important painting in for many reasons, but, also, but most particularly in our case, it's been a great inf influence on younger artists who um, have, have drawn a lot of sustenance from this painting. More often than not, we've collected more recent work, and I, I show you this, this picture by Robert Rauschenberg, which is, uh, um, if, if, there's, if, if, if the Kala was the most requested painting for loan that we have, this must be the second most requested work. And I don't know if you know the history of this picture, but it's a very famous picture in the history of 20th century art. Um, you, you, just to go back to the Guernica that I showed you a moment ago, um, the Guernica was a great obstacle for painters like Jackson Pollock, and they had to figure out a way to, how could I make a picture that could exceed Pollock, uh, uh, Picasso and that great Guernica? And he found a way with the, the great drip paintings that he, that he came to make. Well, for the next generation of artists, it was the abstract expressionists, and I'm speaking of now in New York, 
uh, it was the abstract expressionists who were the obstacle. How could, how could we do something better than de Kooning or Pollock or Franz Klein or Clifford Still? And so Robert Rauschenberg, who was very influenced by Marcel Duchamp, uh, figured out a way to do this. And, and what he did was to essentially eradicate them. Uh, and what he did here was uh, that he went to Willem de Kooning's studio in 1953, and uh, with great fear, he knocked on his door. He was 22 years old at the time, knocked on his door and introduced himself. De Kooning was the great draftsman of the post-war period in New York, make beautiful, beautiful figurative drawings, and asked him if he could meet with him because he wanted de Kooning to give him a drawing for the sole purpose of erasing it. So what he, what he wanted to do was to take a, take a note from Marcel Duchamp, the, the original, the originator of conceptual art, and, and bring this up to the, to the second half of the 20th century, and essentially say to the art world that art is no longer going to be based on my ability as an artist to have great dexterity and make great marks on paper, which of course is what the whole history of art has been based on, make, artists making beautiful marks in one way or another on a piece of paper or on a canvas. Um, and it was now going to be about the ideas that I have as an artist. It's not about, it's not about the marks I make, it's about, it's about the, the quality of my mind. Now, this was extraordinary. Uh, de Kooning, who was a little suspicious of this, but he went along with it, and he gave him a drawing, and Rauschenberg took the drawing, and over the course of a couple of months, and because it was a charcoal drawing, and gouache, and a lot of different media, it took him a long time to erase the drawing. And then he went to his friend uh, uh, Jasper Johns, who lived downstairs from him, and asked Johns to make the, uh, the little label there. It says Erase de Kooning Drawing. Um, and then it's framed. And what you see here is exactly what the drawing is. There's just some traces of, of images there. Now, this is a very, very important work in the history of 20th century art. And, and you might say, well, you know, how do you know this story? And, and this gets to something else that we do very actively and I think ambitiously in, in San Francisco. When we acquire a work of art like this, um, what we do is we try to interview the artist. We try to bring the artist to San Francisco. We try to interview the, them about um, the history of the work, how it was made, what our conservators are very interested in, how to, how to conserve the works over time, how should they be treated, how much light should they receive. And, and our educators, who are, who are very active in terms of putting material online, uh, interviewed Rauschenberg and he told this story and so we have and it was it's remarkable that we got this when we did because of course Rauschenberg died just a few years ago we now have this tape of Rauschenberg talking about uh, this experience of going and knocking on his door and being scared with it and, and bringing a bottle of whiskey with him and this is this is absolutely true a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey with him and knocking on the door and hoping and I quote hoping de Kooning wouldn't be home because he was so afraid um, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing we do, and I was speaking earlier on about the, the, the work that we do online at the museum, and this is, this is something that, that we've taken great pride in, and it's, it's, it's become a kind of a wonderful archive that, uh, that we can share with the public. Uh, another thing that we've been very active in doing is, uh, uh, because contemporary art has become so expensive, uh, as we all know, the market for contemporary art is, seems to have no ceiling, it just c continues ever upward, uh, what we've been very active in doing uh, on probably seven or eight occasions is acquiring works of art with other museums. So in this case, this is an, a, a work by Felix Gonzalez Torres, a Cuban-born artist who died tragically of AIDS in the late 1990s. We actually acquired this work with the permission of his estate uh, in, con in association with the Art Institute of Chicago and the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And so we actually own it in tandem. And um, we could share it, we send it back and forth, uh, we one you know if, if someone wants to borrow it from us uh, for an exhibition of the artist's work we agree that we'll lend it or not lend it and it's a wonderful collaborative relationship and it makes it possible for us to uh, to be active with contem buying contemporary art in, in ways because we do not have such an enormous budget for purchasing art it makes it possible for us to be more active and more flexible and more uh, more energetic in our in our collecting of contemporary art than we might ordinarily be we also have, I mentioned education, we have really strong education programs, which, I, and I'll say more about this in a, a little later on, 
uh, that we're hoping to grow dramatically as we go forward. Uh, we've been very active in the last couple of years in really building our family audience. If you come with a family, we come with children on any Sunday, you are admitted free to the museum and, you're, and you're, there are wonderful programs for your kids and uh, it's, it's become a wonderful aspect of our, uh, of our activity. We now have, I think, about uh, 60,000 family visits of that sort uh, a year, always on Sundays. We also have, as I mentioned, our conservation program. Um, we have a very active conservation lab. We're, we're, I think we, we're trying to redefine, along with other museums of contemporary art, uh, what it means to, be a, to, to conserve works of art, of contemporary art. Uh, it, it used to be that a conservator, when the painting came in the door, their, their function was to maintain it at exactly, in exactly the condition it was when it arrived. Uh, and with contemporary, it's, it's obviously a bit different. And so we really want to engage with the artists and get them to explain how they made the work and, and how we should best conserve it. Uh, this is a cramped little space at present, and, and, and we're very much looking forward to expanding it when we, when we grow. Um, you see there are, that's our senior conservator who's sitting at, this, at, uh, at the easel puzzling over a Sigmar Polka work on paper. Um, I, I thought it was, it's always worth uh, quoting a few statistics. Um, these are a little bit out of date. I have, I have to upgrade these, update these to 2012. But you can see what's happened. In 1994, uh, the last year we were in the old building, the building I showed you in the first slide, we had about 13,000 members. Today we have 45,000 members. And that is, uh, that ranks second in the United States only to the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, and the Museum of Modern Art, of course, plays the game, the museum game by by its, its own rules there in, another, in a stratosphere that we, we can only hope to enter. Uh, but 45,000 members is second highest of any modern museum in the United States. And our attendance, fu fully half of our attendance, half of our visitors that have come to the museum in the entire history of the museum have come since 1995, since we, since we opened that new building that I showed you. So there's, there's a lot of reason in terms of program, in terms of attendance, education, uh, for us to expand. And, um, and that's really what I want to talk about now. So, um, we, have, we are blessed in San Francisco with, as I alluded to earlier, a, a remarkable group of private collectors of, of contemporary art. And probably foremost among, among these collectors is a, a, a couple named Donald and Doris Fisher. And uh, if you've ever worn any Gap jeans, um, they, these were made by uh, the Fisher family. Uh, and they formed what is arguably, I suppose, one of the tenor 15 best collections of, private, of contemporary art anywhere in the world. Um, to be great collectors of contemporary art, you know, you have to, I think you have to do a couple things really, really well. First of all, you have to select the, the right artists. I think you have to always go for the best works, and you have to, and I, this is my personal opinion, you have to really collect those artists in depth. It's fine to have one painting or one sculpture by this, that, and the other artist, but to really collect artists, the, the best artists in depth, that's, to my way of thinking, how you form a great collection. And I think that's exactly what the, what the Fisher family has done. Uh, there are 1,100 works in the collection, and this collection we just, in the last two or three years, made an agreement with that family that the collection will come to the museum. Uh, so all of our plans to expand, which we had anyway, um, have now expanded exponentially, and we're really going to grow to a much, become a much larger museum. So I just want to show you a few images here to give you a sense of the collection that's, that's coming to us. And I, I wouldn't normally do this. I don't put a lot of stock in numbers usually. But just to give you a sense of the, of the depth of, of the holdings that this family has and that we will have in turn, I'll just mention, mention some numbers here. So there are, there are 43 Calders in this collection that will come to the museum. I love this one in particular, as the title uh, might suggest. It's actually, it's not a typical Calder that moves of its own volition, its own accord. It's actually a mecha mechan mechanized pendulum that, that drives uh, each, each of those four uh, little discs. Great collectors of the work of the great German painter Anselm Kiefer. There are six, 16 works in the collection. Uh, Kiefer, of course, the great painter of, um, of, of Germany's uh, cultural memory, I suppose I would say, in the 20th century. Uh, this may be the best painting that Kiefer ever made uh, from 1983. Marvelous collection of pop artist Roy Lichtenstein. There are, I hate to refer to the numbers here, 12 paintings in the collection. Great, great classic pop, pa pop painting. And then we hap we, happily we have a portrait of Roy Lichtenstein by the great painter Chuck Close. There are 14 works of his in the collection. Richard Serra, um, a remarkable group of works, 14 of them. 
uh, this one called Sequence, I'll come back to in a minute. Uh, you'll see it um, uh, sort of in installed uh, in, our, in the new building, the new wing that we're designing. A uh, great painting by Cy Twombly, one of eight, a late painting, uh, and one of the last paintings actually to enter the collection. What, one of the things that makes me very, uh, it really it thrills me about this, is that the collection will come to the museum and it will be paired with our own. And so as it happens, uh, the Fisher's collection, these 1100 works, match up in extraordinary ways with the work that we have in our own. So if, uh, take Andy Warhol for example, the tri Triple Elvis, which is probably the, if there's a, a poster image that you would market for this collection, it would be this great Triple Elvis by Warhol. But we have good holdings of Warhol of our own, and this National Velvet is just one of them. Together we'll have uh, 36 pictures by Warhol when we're done. Uh, Philip Gustin, um, there are great, great paintings in the Fisher Collection, eight, and we, but we have 10 of our own. Uh, this is Gerhard Richter, two of my favorite paintings in our collection. Uh, the one on the right in particular, uh, I think this is Gerhard Richter who is this great chameleon of painting who, who seemingly uh, defies the, 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 uh, the conventional wisdom about modern art, that an artist should somehow get to a particular style and make that style his or her own, a signature style, if you will. Uh, and what Richter has been so great at in defying that is making works of art. In, he can paint with any number of different hands. One day he can be an abstract painter, the next day he's a realist painter. Uh, and this painting on the right, which I think is just uh, dazzling, one of the great, great paintings in, in our collection, one of the best pictures he's ever made. I mean, to my way of thinking, this is, uh, this is Richter taking on Vermeer uh, in, in, his, in his way. Beautiful, gorgeous light. Uh, Bryce Marden, great holdings in both our collections. Mark Rothko, in, in this case we actually have uh, more and better pictures than are coming to us in the, with this private collection. Um, and then we're been, we've been very um, uh, keen to make, the, make sure the museum is, is a, a national museum that we have, and you see a lot of American, American artists that I've shown you, but also great holdings of, of, of international work. We have great, as particular, great European work. And we've also been very active in collecting um, I mentioned William Kentridge, the South African. We've got great collections of Japanese and Chinese art, Mexican photography, uh, making the collection as international as one can. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough task because there really aren't enough travel dollars or enough time in the, in the year for our curators to, to travel and to see all the things that they would need to see to really be great collectors of international art, but, but we're trying. But we're, we're, not, we're also very mindful of the, the artists that, that our own region has, uh, has developed, and I'm just gonna show you two of them, two great painters of you know, the light in San Francisco is, is, is really quite extraordinary. Um, like Istanbul, it's a city that's built around water, and we have this just great luminous light in our city. Uh, and Richard Diemenkorn is one of the two great painters of this, of this marvelous California light. And Wayne Tebow, who's still very much alive and working, uh, and these wonderful whimsical uh, and crystalline paintings of, of the very steep hills of San Francisco. Um, in 2010, we uh, celebrated our 75th anniversary. And this was um, at a time when we were just beginning to make this arrangement with this family to have this collection come to us. And we embarked at that same time uh, on a, what we call a collection campaign. And we've asked a number of our trustees to make promised gifts of works of art to the museum. And I could, I could show you in any number of these, but I thought for, for time's sake, um, I would just show you two. Uh, you'll recall the, the early Pollock that I showed you earlier on, and this Pollock, which is a later picture, a black enamel picture after the drip paintings of the late 1940s. This picture is coming to us. And then a personal favorite of mine, it's probably a little hard to see because there's a lot of light in the room. This is by a wonderful Los Angeles artist, Ed Ruscha. And Ruscha, if, if you know his work at all, he's, a, uh, he's celebrated for making paintings in the most untraditional materials. You know, if, um, if de Kooning actually erased, uh, sorry, if, if uh, Rauschenbruck actually erased the de Kooning drawing, what Ruscha has become quite famous for is making paintings and, and prints with all kinds of alternate materials. Um, so this is a painting that's on red silk on moiré, and it's painted in, if you read the, the little uh, label below the picture, it would say, Ed Ruscha, evil, 1973, um, um, artist blood on moiré. And so what he did was to, take blood from his own body and, and use it as paint. And then it's a kind of, I, I think in a way, it's a kind of self-portrait in a kind of whimsical, uh, kind of offbeat kind of way. Wonderful picture, I think, that's coming to us. 
So I, I want to go back to this, this image um, and talk for a few minutes about architecture. Um, as I said before, this building was built in 1995. It's, it's been an excellent mu building for the museum. It, is, it has spoken to the aspirations of our museum, of our trustees and our staff. We've, we've grown enormously qualitatively and quantitatively in this building. The light in the galleries is, is quite excellent and we're very, we like the building very, very much. Um, we like the building very much once you're inside. I'm not crazy about this building from the outside. If you look at this building, you look at this slide, there's nothing here that says it's an art museum. There's certainly nothing that says it's a contemporary art museum. And there's frankly not much that says we want you to come in to this building. It's a little arch. It's a little stern. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a built, it was designed, it was built in 1995. It was probably designed around 1990 when it was begun. And it's very much of a building of that time. It says, it says to the world that we're the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and we have great aspirations and great ambitions. We're strong. Um, we have a future. Um, but, it, but it doesn't welcome you in. It says we want to protect the art from the public, not that we want to share the art with our public. And the psychology of that, I think, is very, very important. I can't say I was smart enough to realize that at first when I came to the museum, but I did realize it later. And this was in 2006 when uh, behind our museum, we, uh, uh, on the top of a building behind us, we, we put in a sculpture garden, a sculpture, it's a sculpture roof, basically. And we engaged a young San Francisco architect, a man named Mark Jensen, probably 35 years old, to design this garden for us. And if you, if you think about the contrast between the, the facade that you just saw and the brick, which is the, obviously the material that dominates it, and then this from 2006, it's it, the, 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 not only are the materials completely different, this, is, this, this space is about glass and light and air and sunlight and warmth. Uh, we serve great coffee in this, in this space. You know, if you, just to, if you just look at this man here, this, this tells you just about everything you need to know about the psychology of this space. It's about coming, it's about uh, our welcoming a visitor to the museum, it's about meeting your friends, it's about sitting in the sunshine, looking at art, reading a book, having a coffee, and really enjoying yourself. It's about, it's about a new way of thinking about what a museum is. We're not just, you know, for probably the last 100, 150 years, museums have been about protecting art. It's, they've been about collecting art and, and making sure it's safe for, you know, for generations to come. And, and museums have increasingly changed their mission to be much more public, much more social, and I mean social in, a, in the sense of engaging communities and bringing people to the museum. Um, and so we're very much in the middle of this, and, and just in the last couple of years, as we've been planning this new building that I'm just about to show you, uh, we, we drafted a new strategic plan for the museum, a plan that talks about, uses words like generosity and community and sharing. Um, and so when we went out to engage an architect, uh, that's what we wanted to do. So we, we mounted a, a big international search. Uh, all of you know, the usual architectural suspects appeared on our list of architects that we wanted to consider. Some of the great architects of our time uh, wanted, to, wanted to design the addition to our building. You know, it's become, I think one can say, if, uh, if cathedrals were to architects, you know, the, the, the highest aspiration was to design a cathedral you know, for the, or, or a mosque here in Istanbul uh, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Today, it's, it's a museum that represents the highest aspiration for, for an architect. So we had great interest in our project. Um, what we did was we, we engaged this firm called Snohetta. And the first thing you need to know about Snohetta is this, that they, their name is Snohetta. Well, what is, what is Snohetta? You know, if you think of the great, some of the great architects, you think of Frank Gehry or you think of, uh, Renzo Piano, or many, many other architects that one could name who have designed lots and lots of museums. They bear the name of the principal. They bear the name of the lead, the founder of the firm, the lead architect. And Snohetta, in fact, is no one's name. It's actually the name of a mountain in Norway. Uh, and these this two men came together, these two very, very young artists, uh, architects, about the age of 30, one of them Norwegian, one of them American, and they competed for the commission to design the this, uh, this great uh, library in Alexandria, Egypt. It took about 15 years for them to, uh, they, 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 I think they, were, they surprised even themselves by winning the commission. It took about 15 years to get the building built. I've never been able to go and I'm looking forward to the day when I can go visit this because I hear it's a marvelous building. 
Um, and, and then they f what they did was they finished that building and then they formed their firm. They, brought, they created a firm for themselves in Oslo. Um, so what happened was we uh, formed a committee, as American museums tend to do when they want to hire an architect. You gather together some of your lead donors, some of your key people, and your staff, and you, and you go through a process and you look at a lot of firms. And so uh, we narrowed, the, narrowed this list down to you know, 20 firms, and then we narrowed it down to eight firms, and then we narrowed it down to four firms. Uh, and one of the four firms was Snohetta, and I was the only one uh, probably in San Francisco who had ever seen one of their buildings because they've not made a building in San Francisco in the United States yet, and they simply were not well known at all. And I had seen this building and it, was, it, it, it expressed everything I wanted the museum to be. Uh, what you see here, and I think you can get the sense of this very, very quickly, is how this remarkable building, which is a, the National Opera and Ballet Theater in Oslo, how it works. It, it seems to come right out of the water, right out of the fjord, uh, and people enter the building here. But if you don't want to enter the building, you can walk right up on top of the roof, right over the, on top of the building, quite literally and figuratively, and you can see this here as well. If you walk around the back of the building, you, um, you can look in uh, windows and watch the, the craftspeople, the artisans, making the sets, making the wigs, making the stage designs for the opera and for the ballet. There's a kind of transparency and a kind of openness about this building that I felt we just had to have. And so it was, it was quite an ordeal to convince our search committee, our trustees, that we had to go all the way to Oslo to see this building. And I said, just, just be patient with me. This will be worth your while. And this was the last building we saw, the last firm that we met with, and the, the vote was unanimous, and our trustees were 100% behind it. So it's been a great experience to work with them. They now are just beginning to finish some work in the United States. This is a building that's complete. Uh, it's the only building uh, to be constructed on the uh, September 11th site. Uh, I think you probably made, oh, I'm sorry. Um, what, what's been done here, of course, that where, the, where the two towers once stood are now large fountains. And this is a, a kind of a, a memorial pavilion that will welcome visitors to the site. It's, it's done, but it's, it's, it's mired in all kinds of bureaucratic uh, problems in the city and the state of New York and it's not yet open to everybody's dismay. It's now 12 years later and, it's, and this building is not open. But it's an extraordinary building and, and they're now beginning to have a lot of work. <clears throat> I think it's a name that you will start to see in, in, your, in your reading and looking at architecture uh, for the next few years. They're in their late 40s now. So the building uh, that we're, we're designing uh, is on this site. Uh, here's the front of the museum. When I showed you the brick facade, I was, you were looking from here. Um, and initially we thought we might uh, design a little wing right here, right on the side. We own this land, but we didn't build it out. Um, and then we decided at Snowhead's urging that what we really needed was not a separate museum, a separate new wing. We needed the, the experience of the two buildings to be seamless. You had to feel as though, although the buildings, as you will see right away, will look very, very different from the outside. We want them to be seamless from the inside so the visitor experience will be uh, kind of effortless and, and, and you can concentrate on the art and not think about the fact that you're in another, another architectural design. So um, a kind of a wonderful story that went with this. We needed to have these two buildings and um, we didn't own either one of them. We were able to buy this, this building here which was a, a small a business college uh, that had gone out of business and then we turned our attention to this building right here which doesn't look like a very big deal. It's not a very big piece of property but it happens to be uh, the site of a firehouse in San Francisco. And it's owned by the city, of course, and it's a government building. And um, we had to make a deal with the city because we had to have this piece of property. And so what we've done, in the, I, you know, I'll, I'll write a book someday about the, the history of this project. Um, what we've done is to essentially build the city of San Francisco a new firehouse. It's about six or seven blocks from the, from the existing one. Uh, and the city has agreed and the fire, de fire department has agreed to essentially occupy this new firehouse and it will be done in a few months, then we can break ground. And then they will give us, the city will deed us this piece of property and we'll sit, tear down both of these buildings. And then what you see is this will be the site of the new museum. So it's behind, as you'll see in a moment, it's behind the old museum, uh, but in a very, very kind of interesting way. So this is the facade and if you were looking from um, here, if we were standing right here, maybe on the 10th floor of this building, this is what you would see. Um, it's, a t it's a long, narrow site, um, and, uh, and it's, it's seven stories 
of public space and then three stories at the top for new offices for the staff. Um, what you're, if you, you may recall earlier on that I showed you those works, those sculptures, but a very, very big sculpture by Richard Serra, and that's, that's it right there. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that as opposed to the existing building, which is brick, which is rather opaque, rather uh, a little un unyielding, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it has a kind of strength, but it doesn't say a word about art and it doesn't say a word about contemporary art. The first thing you see as you drive down this street or you walk down this street is you see this 35 foot high glass, or 25 feet high, 25 foot high glass window. You see right into the museum and there is no question that you're looking at not just a museum but a museum of contemporary art. Uh, you'll be able to enter this, the first floor of the museum free of charge. You will not be ticketed until you go up into the galleries upstairs. We think this is a very, uh, very indicative of the goal we have to be more generous with the museum as we go forward. Um, let's see if I can show you another better slide. Get down there a little bit lower. And you can, I think, see what this building might become in terms of its public impact. Um, when you enter the building, there'll be now a new entrance, a second entrance. This is where I'm going to position you in the next slide. Right here, you're going to be standing. And there's a little, they've, we've created an, uh, this little lane, uh, as it were. And you'll, you'll come to the museum this way. There's the side of the Sarah. That's the glass window that I just showed you. You have to use both slides here. Uh, big tall glass window, and you'll make your way up these steps and into the building. And I think you can see this here. San Francisco is a city of hills, as Istanbul is, I've come to realize. And uh, so there, there we have these wonderful stairs in, in, that, that, that run throughout the museum. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're going to make one change in the existing building. Really, we want to be very respectful of uh, the, the Mario Bota design. And in fact, the architects and I went to visit Bota uh, last summer, he lives and works in Lugano uh, in Switzerland, and we went, went and paid homage basically to him. And there was a kind of ceremonial, um, how, would, how would you say, a kind of passing of the baton, passing of the torch from the, architects of the, the architect of the original building to our new architects. Um, and we went to him and we said, there's one change we want to make in your building, Mr. Bota, and it's, it's the stair. If you come in the building, this is the first thing you see. Uh, it's a, a stairway that takes you up. It's a series of switchbacks, and you make your way up. It's, it's, as you can see here, even in this slide, it's a rather dark stair, and it's always struck me as a, as a kind of heavy uh, sort of obstruction. It's, it, it reminds me a little bit of a fireplace in a home. Uh, it's, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't beg you to enter. Uh, and, and probably 95% of the visitors who come to the museum and come through the front door don't go up these stairs at all. They actually, there, there are escalators here on the side, and, and a few people come down, but virtually no one takes these stairs up. So the architects came to me and said, well, do you think we could take this stair out? And I said, well, I said, you're going to have to replace it with something great <laughs> because it is, you know, it's a kind of a landmark in San Francisco and people will miss it if you don't do a good job. So we're still working on this. Uh, this is the, currently what, what the design looks like, but I think it'll, it'll improve. You can see how it opens up the space. You get up to the second floor coming from the old entrance in a, in a very graceful way. Uh, these, these walls will not rela uh, remain white for long. Uh, there will probably, we'll, it's, these are wonderful walls, we'll probably put uh, big murals on them or something, we're not sure yet. This is not the final design, in fact, this, I just saw this, this rendering for the first time about 10 days ago, so it's, it's still very much a work in progress. This will be the new atrium space, uh, a, a kind of uh, arching space, uh, wonderful space for hanging a calder or a solid wall drawing. Uh, there will be a green wall outside that we feel is very, very important to uh, you know, ecologically, it's very important that we, that we give you a sense uh, throughout this experience of this now much larger museum of, of being outdoors and being somewhere related to nature. Uh, if you look back, if you're, uh, if you're standing where this man is and you turned around and looked faced the opposite way, this is what you would see. You're looking back out now to the new entrance. Uh, there will be a galleries devoted to photography. And if you made your way all the way down this path, you would come to this. And here's the Richard Serra again, and that glass window wall that, you, that greets you from that, from that new entrance. And I have you know, visions of these stairs, these Roman stairs, uh, being used by uh, teachers with classes or people just gathering, meeting uh, friends there. And uh, we have in mind that this Serra will be there for a couple of years, but over time, it will become a, a space where we'll commission artists to make work 
that will be up for six months or a year. So it's, it'll be, a, again, a very, it'll be emblematic of our commitment to contemporary art. As you go upstairs, I, I mentioned all the Calders we're going to have, and we're going to have a gallery dedicated to Calder. Calder is, of course, an enor enormously important artist, but also an enormous, enormously accessible artist. And, you know, I, I think of him as sort of a, a, an artist who's, uh, uh, you know, loved by, by children of all ages, I might say. Uh, everyone loves this work, and we're going to be able to have a kind of constantly rotating group of uh, Calder's works on view in the museum. I'll just show you a couple of slides here of, of the galleries. Um, one of the things that has been interesting in our experience of working with these architects is that this is their first art museum. And um, as I said earlier, architects really, really desire to design museums. And uh, my experience with architects designing archit uh, museum architecture is that every, every architect wants, thinks that they can solve all the problems of museum architecture, that have, you know, museums have been around for a couple of hundred, 300 years, I suppose. And every architect, I think, wants to make the perfect museum because this is in some way a mark of their legacy. And we, we spent a lot of time with, with our architects in, in designing this first museum of theirs. We traveled around the United States and we traveled around Europe looking at museum architecture with them and looking at you know, how the lights worked and what the proportions were and how the walls meet the floor and all the fine points of, of what makes a good gallery and what makes a good museum space. And, and finally, we were able to convince them, and it took some doing, I have to say, they're a little stubborn about this, that they really didn't have to reinvent the gallery, the museum. They just had to give us clean, clear, simple, uh, restrained spaces, and the art would do the best, do the, do the rest. Our curators are terrific, and they will be able to do a great job with the, with the great pictures we have. Just, you know, um, we, don't, we don't want galleries that scream of architecture, if you will. And so you get a sense of this. The different floors have different, different uh, arrangements of one sort or another. We're still working hard on the lighting system uh, that we'll put in. We haven't resolved it quite yet. We want it to be as minimal as we can, but still be effective. Um, you see some of the paintings that I showed you earlier. This is the, the Bryce Marden pictures I showed you. This is the Cy Twombly. Um, more Twombly, more, this is Diebenkorn here I showed you before. As you get to the top floor where we'll have the most contemporary art, uh, the ceiling will go away and it'll be a little bit like, like the Istanbul modern ceiling. Uh, it'll be unrefined, it'll be open, you'll see the ductwork uh, up above, it'll be a little bit more raw uh, and as I think befits uh, galleries dedicated to the most contemporary art. We're building a new education space. Uh, I, I've spoken about our commitment to education and we're we're going to have a wonderful new education center. Uh, there are a number of different places. We, we really don't want education for visitors to the museum to only be in an education center. We don't want it to be segregated in one space. We want, it to, to, uh, we want the museum to be full of education everywhere you go. So this is a, a, uh, this kind of marvelous space that, that the architects have designed for us. This is 35 feet high, and we can use it for all sorts of things, for dinners, we can use it for uh, board meetings and accessions meetings, and we can use it for, for families and kids and all kinds of activities. Um, we can use it for performing arts if we want. Uh, and so this is how the building will look when it's finally done. Uh, I think you see what they're trying to do here. Here, of course, is the Boda building, which is at five stories. This is 10, and this is, a, by San Francisco standards, a very old building. Uh, it's from 1926. It shows you how young our city is, uh, it's a, but it's one of the first skyscrapers to appear in San Francisco. Uh, and so, they, so our architects really want to be respectful and from the front at least to really show this kind of stepped up, stepping up of, of these layers as you, as you go from front to back. And I think they've done a, a, a quite marvelous job. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm, I'm recognized right away that the, the slide I'm showing is, really, is now probably about a year old and it's, it's changed a lot since then, but it does give you a sense uh, of how the building might look uh, when we open in 2016. The la this is the last slide I wanted to show, but I do have one little thing I want to add at the end. We, they produced a little film for us. It's just two minutes long, and you'll maybe get a, 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 perhaps a little bit better sense of how that building's going to feel. So let me just see if I can make this work. It's amazing what can be done through technology now. It can create a, a power, uh, an image uh, like this little film.
Okay, that's, that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. And